Okay. Okay, I think we have that. Well, uh, I will add my welcome to Steve's. Um, there's somebody else coming in, obviously. Um, my name is Gad Human. I'm one of the organizers uh, of the seminar, along with Steve Cushion and Kate Quinn. Unfortunately, Kate may not be able to join us this evening, but let's hope she will be able to do so. And it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Paul Klammer uh, to the seminar. As you may have heard when we were chatting, Paul is a, a travel writer, an independent researcher, uh, the author of the book we're discussing this evening, uh, Black Crown, Henri Christophe, The Haitian Revolution and the Caribbean's Forgotten Kingdom, which was published earlier this year. And he also wrote, as he was just saying, The Brat Guide to Haiti, and has been involved with extensive writing for a whole series of, yeah, there it is, the book, uh, a whole series of guides for lonely planets. So I'm sure actually you probably all read various contributions that, that you have done. Um, so we will follow the the usual drill. His his presentation is indeed the title of, of, of the book he's discussing. And um, we'll ask him to speak for around 30 minutes. And we, I would ask you to uh, store up your questions because we will hope to have a very interesting uh, Q&A. So I will, with, without further ado, I will ask Paul to, to begin. Thank you, Gad. It's a real uh, pleasure to join. I'm just, hopefully everyone can, can see, um, I'm sharing the screen and always uh, as a writer, starting off with a shameless uh, plug um, for my book. <laughs> I will also just apologize if I have coughing throughout uh, the talk. I've just been getting over a, 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 an appalling cold. So I apologize um, for any um, disruption of that. But thank you for joining me. Uh, for joining us so my book which came out earlier in the year with with Hearst Black Crown um, is a sort of a dual book a dual biography it's a biography of Henri Christophe who was uh, born enslaved um, uh, was a leading uh, light of the Haitian Revolution and then later crowned himself uh, the king of Haiti um, in 1811 and, and this is something that I'll be talking about but it's also a history of the Haitian Revolution um, and I think particularly uh, the period of Haiti immediately after independence um, in 1804 because something that I found um, throughout uh, the time that I spent living in Haiti um, and reading a lot of Haitian histories um, is that while the Haitian Revolution is increasingly uh, studied and written about a lot of those stories tend to finish on January the 1st, 1804, uh, with the Declaration of Haitian Independence. And part of my uh, interest um, was, was really in about what happens uh, next in this, this period, the sort of the first uh, 16 or so years um, of Haitian independence with uh, the Haitian Civil War and the foundation of the, the, uh, the Haitian ki the Kingdom of Haiti. And then of course, what happened uh, to that uh, kingdom under the rule um, of Henri Christophe. Um, I'm sure we all, this is a map we're all familiar with, but as a travel writer, I do always like to start with a map just to sort of so we can situate ourselves right here in the centre. Um, we have Haiti, but I would just draw your attention down to the bottom uh, right of the screen, the tiny island of Grenada, uh, right off the coast of South America, because this is actually where um, our story begins um, in October, almost to the week, actually, October the 10th, uh, 1767, which is where um, Henri Christophe was born, born enslaved um, on the island of Grenada. Um, this was then a British uh, possession. Um, Britain had taken uh, the island from the French um, during the Seven Years' War. But this is a long way from Haiti. This is a long way from the colony of Saint-Domingue, which is, is, is what Haiti was then. Um, and the story of how Christophe ends up um, in Saint-Domingue is almost as compelling um, as the story um, of his time as, as a king. And if we were to read any uh, Haitian school book, now the story that we will be told, that we were told is that on the cusp of his 12th birthday, uh, Christophe was taken from Grenada um, on a French fleet. The French had just recaptured the island of Grenada um, as part of the sort of the, their support for America during the American Revolutionary War. And he was carried, um, but to Saint-Domingue, but actually um, America, where he joins a regiment of free black soldiers 
are from Saint-Domingue. They're called the Chasse Volontaire, and they fight on the side of the French during the siege of Savannah in Georgia. And this, here, um, which was erected about 20 years ago, on the far left of this, um, we see the figure um, of Christophe as a drummer boy, which is what Haitian tradition tells us. Uh, he served out again. He was basically he would have had his eighth, uh, his twelfth birthday, excuse me, um, actually in uh, in Savannah. Now, with so many aspects of Christophe's early life, the sources are are problematic. Um, there's been a lot of searches. I've seen a lot of scholars before me have looked for primary evidence of Christophe at the Battle of Savannah. Indeed, primary evidence that he was born on October the tenth. Uh, 1767 in the Isle of Grenada. And a lot of what we're dealing with is, is say, a lot of what we're dealing with is secondary sources. This is discussed in, in ridiculous detail in, in my book. Um, but we're going to take it as read that, that he was born in Grenada, that he was born in 1767, that he was, that he was set in, in Savannah as a child soldier. And in fact, Baron de Vate, who was the great writer, who was the great propagandist of the Kingdom of Haiti, writes in 1816 that Christophe was, was wounded on the um, on the field of battle in Savannah, so we know at least that Christoph felt that it was important that people recognised that he was there. And in fact, critics of his crazy contemporary critics, Haitian critics of his regime at the time, also accepted that he had served at Savannah. Um, so we're going to take that as a given. At the end um, of uh, the service of the Chasse Volunteer, they relocate back to um, Saint Domingue. This is a, a colonial map of French Saint Domingue. Um, and here at the north, in this little cleft here, or just to the right, actually, here, we have the city of Le Cap. Uh, Cap Francais, um, the largest and uh, wealthiest city um, in the colony of Saint-Domingue. At this time, about the same size as, as colonial Boston. Um, it's rich, and it's rich because um, the the island, the colony of Saint-Domingue, and certainly particularly the, the, the northern plain around this city, um, is full of sugar plantations. Up in the mountains, this is a very, very mountainous island, the island of Hispaniola. The mountains are absolutely covered with, with coffee plantations as well. So of course, it's a rich colony and it's rich because that wealth is born um, out of the, uh, the blood and the labor of enslaved human beings. Um, the population of, of the colonies of um, Saint-Domingue at this time is, a, is around about half a million. Um, ninety percent of those are enslaved Africans, and on the eve of the Haitian Revolution in the summer of seventeen ninety one, um, Saint Domingue is importing forty thousand kidnapped human beings every year into this 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 machine of of, of death, basically to produce more than half the sugar and coffee in the world, indigo, cotton, <clears throat> and other colonial products. Um, now Christophe's life. Here we we <clears throat> he's existing really on the cusp of freedom and enslaved. Uh, we certainly know there there are no formal emancipation documents, but we certainly have other records of enslaved people who had served in the Savannah campaign being emancipated. Um, and he's working in a coaching inn called uh, La Cour Le Cour, which of course in French is the Crown, which is the most beautiful piece of nominative determinism. Given that a few years later he's going to end up um, crowning himself. King, and this is just a little picture, um, a contemporary painting, um, of the uh, of the city of, of Cap Francais, um, at the time. Now the Haitian Revolution breaks out in August seventeen ninety one. I'm sure it's a narrative that most of us here are pretty familiar with. It's not something certainly I want to get into too much detail, except to to really remind ourselves that it's incredibly complicated, um, as well as the enslaved fight fighting the colonists, the, the white colonists are fighting amongst themselves because this is contemporaneous with the French Revolution. So you have the struggle between royalists um, <clears throat> and republicans. But Christophe more or less sits out the first couple of years of the uh, Haitian Revolution. And the first time he appears in the sort of the written archive is in June 1793, where he's a member of the city militia, uh, uh, a captain of artillery. And he takes part in the defense of uh, Cap Francais, fighting on the side of the radical Republican uh, commissioners who've been sent from revolutionary France, uh, fighting against reactionary white racist uh, factions um, who are trying to sort of uh, reclaim, they the counter-revolutionaries essentially. Um, and Christophe is serving in the militia, defending the city 
uh, during which Cap Francais, as we can see in this um, engraving here, almost half the city um, burns to the ground. Um, and this action is the cap the catalyst for the uh, Republican commissioners to declare that all the enslaved in uh, in Saint Domingue are free if they will flock um, to the banner of Republican France. Um, and really, two key events um, happen. This uh, one is um, this emancipation, um, and uh, the second is just a few weeks after the burning of the cap. Christophe gets married. He marries. Um, uh, a young woman called Mary Louise Cordovid, who comes from a free black um, uh, family uh, from the city, and she gives birth to their first child, Francois Ferdinand, um, in early um, 1794, at roughly the same time that the new universal emancipation is declared throughout the entire French Empire, which is as a direct result of the actions um, at this time in in Saint Domingue. Um, Christophe then rises really, really rapidly throughout the ranks of the uh, of the Republican army. He's serving under Toussaint Louverture. He becomes uh, very quickly he becomes a major, then a colonel, uh, and a general. Uh, he helps uh, lead the fight for Toussaint Louverture against Louverture's enemies in the south, which uh, are the people who came from that free black class um, that provided the the troops for um, for the chassis volontaire and. Savannah, particularly leading against the troops of a general called um, uh, Alexandre Pétion, who is going to re-enter our narrative um, a little bit later. Um, as the calendar ticks over into 1800, Toussaint Louverture is the governor general of the colony, um, and while he loudly proclaims his loyalty uh, to Republican France, Saint-Domingue at this stage is basically de facto independent. Now, in Paris, um, Napoleon uh takes control and he doesn't like this one bit at all um he calls Toussaint um a gilded african uh he wishes that slavery hadn't been abolished um in the french empire and one of the first things he thinks he does um after the peace of amiens with, with britain is that he sends an enormous armada led by his brother-in-law uh charles emmanuel leclerc uh to wrest back control of saint -Denis. And this is a plaque um, that stands um, at the base of a statue of Christophe in downtown Port-au-Prince that was erected um, to celebrate uh, the 150th anniversary um, of Haitian independence in um, 1954. It really shows um, Christophe's great moment. He is uh, the military commander of Cap Francais, and he refuses permission for the French fleet to land. Uh, the French profess they come in peace, but he knows they're lying. Um, and rather than let them land, um, you can see here the city um, is set on fire. So he burns uh, the city to the ground so the French can take control of the ashes. Now, the popular French tradition is the signal for this. The popular Haitian tradition for this, I beg your pardon. He does this by setting fire um, to his own uh, house. Uh, but then the army, his army and the armies of Toussaint, the armies of uh, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, who is the other great uh, leader of the uh, of the, uh, the Republican army at this time, they retreat into the mountains um, to wage a guerrilla war. Um, this is when the Haitian Revolution really starts to evolve into a war of independence. It's incredibly complicated. Um, Toussaint, Christophe Dessalines make a tactical surrender at one point to the French um, to bide time to gather their forces because they know, of course, the French uh, will be ravaged um, by uh, yellow fever, by malaria. Unfortunately, it doesn't go well for, for Louverture because he's arrested and shipped back to, to France where he, he dies in April, eight, April 1803 um, in a freezing cell in, Jura, in the Jura Mountains. But throughout the second half of 1802, into 1803, uh, the War of Independence becomes this bloody, almost um, genocidal uh, affair. Uh, the France is now at war with Britain again, so the French, the French can't send reinforcements. Um, on the 18th of November 1803, uh, Christophe takes part in the Battle of Vertier outside the on the outskirts of, uh, of, of Cap Francais, which sees the final defeat of the French army, uh, who are taken into captivity by by British ships. And on January the 1st, 1804, you can see here, this is the proclamation by the indigenous army, as they called themselves, um, the proclamation of Haitian independence. Um, we'll 
with uh, Dessalina as the new head of state and Christoph um, being the second signature um, as the second most powerful figure in, in the, the, the country, the second signature um, of Haitian independence. Now, there's a great fear that the French can come back at any moment. Um, so one of the first things that Dessalines does is to order a project of national defence. Um, and the interior is to be fortified. Uh, they've learned that lesson that you burn the ports, you retreat into the interior uh, to wage a guerrilla war. Um, and Christophe, this is the really, we see the absolute... The, first great flowering of his genius he's put in charge of building the forts across the north and this is the citadel also called the citadel Henri, uh sometimes also called citadel la Ferrière, which is haiti's part of haiti's only uh unesco world heritage site this is a, a fort uh the largest fortress um in all of the americas it's on top of a mountain it is an absolutely staggering place it's a, a piece of cutting edge early 19th century uh military architecture um, a lot of uh, foreign observers uh, in the 19th century proclaimed, who um, could only see it through kind of racist eyes, proclaimed that it must have been built by the French or it had been built with the help of German engineers and other figures like this. But we have actually a lot of Christoph's letters, um, which are in King's College, or King's College London. Uh, where we can see him, and he is this incredible micromanager. He's one of his great skills is as a manager, as as a as a logistician. So we have literally dozens and dozens of his letters, ordering um, carpenters to site blacksmiths, uh, ordering that French plantations be uh, demolished for their bricks, uh, specifying the lengths of ropes so that cannon can be pulled up to the top of this mountain, and it's just really. Um, you know, an absolutely um, astonishing place. Uh, the uh, playwright Amy Césaire wrote his, his his great play, the La Tra Tragédie de Loire of Christophe, um, and in it he writes about the citadel. For this people to them, a monument was needed to make them stand up, and that the citadel was was certainly um, that. Now. Dessalines, it turned out, Dessalines, it turned out, didn't need to be fearing the French. He needed to be fearing his own generals because there was a lot of resentment, particularly in the south of Haiti, amongst the generals like Pétion, um, for the way that uh, Haiti had been divided up, um, nationalisation of plantations a lot before the revolution, a lot of the, the free black uh, class had been landowners themselves. Um, and in 1806, uh, Alexandre Pétion uh, leads a conspiracy uh, through which Dessalines is um, assassinated um, at a place called Pont Rouge. This is the memorial on the spot, um, which is was outside Port-au-Prince, is now uh, very much in uh, within the urban sprawl of, of Port-au-Prince. Um, this is a, a monument that was erected. The original was destroyed in the, the 2010 earthquake. This was erected a few years um, afterwards. Um, and Pétion, you can see him here, um, proclaims uh, the end of tyranny um, in Haiti, but is very canny that he immediately pledges his loyalty to Christophe and, and proclaims that Christophe should be, become the president. Um, Christophe is not part of this conspiracy, but he, he is happy to take advantage of this. Haiti is going to become a republic. It's no longer going to become the, this empire. I didn't sort of talk about this, but that Dessalines had proclaimed himself the, the emperor of Haiti. Um, but basically, um, Pétion stitches Christophe up like a kipper. And the, the first meeting of the new Haitian Senate, which is held in Port-au-Prince, a long way from Christophe's power base in the north of, uh, of Haiti, uh, Pétion has the meeting, has the Senate stuffed with his own supporters. Uh, they turn the presidency into a purely ceremonial role uh, with all power um, residing in the Haitian Senate, which, surprise, surprise, is, is led by this figure, um, uh, Alexandre Pétion. Now, Christophe, as the head of the Haitian army, uh, is not having any of this. Um, he marches his army down to the gates of Port-au-Prince on Independence Day, January the 1st, 1807, um, declaring uh, Pétion outlaw, as we can see here in this proclamation, which is in the National Archives um, in queue. And this uh, thus begins the Haitian Civil War, which is going to basically, and the division of the country into uh, spoiler for what happens next, uh, into until basically that lasts uh, for the rest of Christoph's life. Um, 
the two on the army the haitian army had been great at fighting the french when they were fighting each other they were unsurprisingly pretty uh, evenly matched uh, both sides lead an arms race uh, they try to establish navy a navy uh buying ships actually from from london uh, this is Thomas Goodall. I'm talking today from Bristol, and Thomas Goodall is a good uh, Bristol boy, um, and he becomes Christoph's admiral. He he um, buys on Christoph's behalf a number of ships um, in London for 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 Christoph. Um, but essentially, um, the the country is is divided in two, and here you can see you know, just a very very simple line. Um, to, to show uh, how the uh, how the country is divided. Um, and this conflict burns sort of hot and cold for the next few years until uh, Christoph, one of the, he, he wants to break the deadlock. And in March, 1811, the Northern state of Haiti, of which Christoph is the president, announces that it's gonna become a monarchy. And in, in the first week of June, 1811, Christoph is crowned uh, Henri the first um, of Haiti. And this here um, is his coat of arms. Um, God, my cause and my sword is the, the motto of the kingdom. And inside you, on the shield, you probably can't quite read it, but his personal motto, Je René de mes centres, I am reborn from my ashes and with a, uh, the image of the crowned phoenix. And of course, he had been involved with the, the, the burning um, of the city, uh, both in 1793 and then again in 1802 to, to resist the landing in Napoleon's army. So really, really a perfect symbol uh, for his kingdom. But the question has always bothered a lot of people, has bothered a lot of historians. Why did Christoph decide that he wanted to become a president? And I think there are a lot of uh, elements at play here. Uh, one is, I think there's a bit of one-upmanship. A few weeks before the proclamation, uh, Pétion had been re-elected um, as the president of the Republic of Port-au-Prince. Um, I think there's a play for diplomatic uh, recognition. This is maybe we can talk about something in the Q and A. But uh, both uh, Christophe and Petion have been making great plays with envoys in London to to get uh, the British government uh, to recognise uh, the independence of uh, of Haiti and themselves as legitimate uh, rulers. And one of the first Christophe's first recorded words as king at his coronation banquet is him raising a toast to his brother, King George III of, of Great Britain. Uh, so I think there's a great play with this. He was born in Grenada. He made, it was always made a play of his, uh, that he was an Englishman by birth. Um, in the uh, associated papers from the Council of State that describe the, the creation of monarchy, they also point out that Napoleon himself had uh, created a whole series of monarchies uh, throughout Europe, putting his own brothers, um, you know, on the, on the, the throne in um, in Italy, I think in Spain as, as elsewhere, um, and he points to tiny countries like Belgium, who had their own uh, monarchies, who hadn't even been powerful enough to beat the French, and Haiti had beaten the French. So what's good enough for for them is certainly good enough for the Haitians. And then I think two things which are not really talked about as much, certainly in the Council of State orders, um, is a recognition that of course the majority of Haitians had been born um, not in Haiti but in Africa. Uh, one of Christoph's leading generals, um, who becomes the Duke de Marmalade because he creates this, this great nobility, uh, we know certainly was born um, in the Kingdom of Con Congo. So this is a, um, a political system that's, that's very much recognised by Haitians, and particularly the idea of Haiti as a nation in itself is something that's very new. So this is an idea of, of active state building. And then just finally... Um, he lays claim to a tradition within the island of Hispaniola himself. And there are written accounts um, of the Tainos fighting the Spanish. Um, and one of the last Taino chiefs, the caciques, who fought the Spanish to, to actually to a standstill where they, the Spanish had to sue um, and sign a peace treaty, um, had the Spanish name of Enrique, um, so Honre. Um, and in the official account of the coronation, this line is very, very explicitly drawn in a very anti-colonial way um, between the original Taino inhabitants and, and Christoph as being an inheritor of their tradition. And as I said, um, he creates this, this incredible nobility um, with a wonderful armorial, uh, so something like 92 um, nobles, princes, barons, dukes, knights. Um, and 
I could give you a whole, we could have a whole talk about these because I just think they're so beautiful to look at. But I just wanted to put just a couple up to show that um, the Haitian monarchy is to some degree sort of sui generis because he's created, taking um, elements from European heraldry, uh, but melding them very consciously uh, with um, iconography from Africa, as we can see here with the rhinos, um, and the Caribbean, as we can see here with the Caribbean iguanas, on the coat of arms of the Baron de Belliard. And if, if you're wondering what uh, the title of the Baron de Belliard was, he's the keeper of the Royal Gardens. That's why he's got a rake um, and a watering can. Uh, if you ever want to, to see this armorial, it's in the College of Arms just behind St. Paul's Cathedral. And it's just an absolutely beautiful, um, beautiful thing. Uh, but even more powerful as a symbol of, of the kingdom uh, was his palace, the Palace of Sanssouci, which he started building uh, in about 1807. It had a printing press, it had a mint, it was a royal barracks. This painting uh, was created by um, a, a Haitian painter called Numa de Roche, who was a graduate of Christophe's new uh, Royal Painting Academy. Um, this is what uh, Sans Souci exists today. Sadly, um, it was ruined in an earthquake in 1842. This uh, picture was taken. Uh, by Cameron Moreau of, of uh, University of California, Santa Cruz has been doing some really, really interesting archaeology um, on the site, looking into its construction <clears throat> uh, over the last few years. Um, this is the bit in the talk where I realise I haven't actually shown you what Christoph looks like. Uh, so here he is, uh, painted in the grand manner. Um, this painting actually was uh, was exhibited in the Royal Academy in London. Um, in 1818, it was done by an artist called Richard Evans, who was a student of Sir Thomas Lawrence. Sir Thomas Lawrence. Um, and Evans was employed by Christophe, um, courtesy of William Wilberforce. The kingdom was very quick to build uh, relations with Wilberforce, Thomas Clarkson, um, other abolitionists, Sir Joseph Banks, the, the president of the Royal Society. Um, and this portrait was actually uh, was owned by William Wilberforce at one point and is now in the National Museum um, back in Haiti. But you can see here in his Windsor coat, the crown and this idealized view from Sans Souci out to his kingdom. This is a portrait uh, which actually was not known um, until about four years ago when it came up for auction in um, New York. Uh, this is the Prince uh, Victor Henri. Um, and his sisters, um, Amethyst um, and Athenair, and we didn't previously know what, what the two princesses look like. We're still hoping um, that a portrait of the Queen of Mary Louise is going to um, crop up at, uh, at, at some point, because we still don't, we certainly know there were portraits painted of her, uh, but we still don't know um, what he looks like. But this is all Christoph performing uh, the idea of monarchy, because he's being unsuccessful in his diplomatic lobbying of, of Britain. Uh, so instead, he takes this idea of soft power. So if you're reading the Morning Chronicle um, in your uh, London coffee house in 1815, uh, you might come across reports of the grand new state coaches, which Christophe had built for, made for him in, in London, of the dresses, the beautiful dresses that have been uh, sewn um, for the Queen and the Princesses, of the uh, pottery, such as this uh, plate, which was made by the Spo Pottery Works. This is a plate that's actually in the Victorian Albert Museum. And um, also, not just what he's, uh, the luxury goods he's buying, of course, with sugar and coffee, which has been grown by free men and women, and this is always something that is very much underscored. Um, but also reprinting uh, translated extracts from the Gazette Royal Deity, the, the Kingdom's newspaper, talking about the great progress that the kingdom is making towards civilization. So they're talking, excuse me, they're talking about the English teachers who have come to the, uh, the kingdom to set up schools, um, talking about uh, the fact that Christoph had introduced smallpox vaccination, um, talking about the great trading opportunities. Um, so it's a really a very much a sort of a, a propaganda on the part of, of Christoph. Um, many books as well that are being published. I mentioned uh, earlier in this, the piece, uh, Baron de Vate, the great writer. Um, this is his great book, which was only tra finally translated into English um, about a dozen years, 10 or so years ago. Uh, the colonial system unveiled. If it had been translated into English earlier, I think this would be a work that is much better known. Um, this is an absolutely um, incendiary tract of uh, anti-colonial writing 
Um, when you look at abolitionist writing at this uh, time, you'll often get a lot of very polite references to slaves being ill-used um, by their masters. Um, Vate has none of this. He gives a really troubling account. It's, it's a hard read um, of, ex of explicit acts of violence to individual people on individual plantations uh, by plantation owners now in France. And then he makes the connection between the violence enacted on black bodies uh, to the entire um, Enlightenment colonial project. Um, it's, it's, he's up there with, with Fanon. He's an incredible writer. I, I urge you to, 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 to pick up a copy of this, translated by Chris Bongi, Liverpool University Press. Uh, an absolutely um, amazing, amazing book. Um, there's a book of law. I'm just being aware of the time here. There's a, the Book of Law, the Code Honorary. It's an 800-page volume where he tries to codify um, all of life um, in the uh, in, in the kingdom. Uh, he produces some of the first. I mean, when when you go through this, there's some really, really interesting things. I mean, he regulates uh, marriage, um, you know, inheritance, things like this, education, but also um, some of the first um, laws against animal cruelty. Uh, I think that are on record in, anywhere. Um, also, a lot of um, laws about food security for planting uh, mango, breadfruit trees, things like this, all in the event that, uh, that there are food stocks for, for should um, France ever, ever come back. Um, and as I mentioned, all of this, uh, the produce um, grown um, by free labour, this is a, uh, the only surviving agricultural ledger that I'm aware of uh, for, from the kingdom. Um, which is in um, the Schomburg Center for, for, for Black Research, looking at uh, mainly at this stage, actually uh, coffee production, sugar production really, really does fall off. And certainly um, it's sort of a, a brown sugar rather than the, the very fine uh, high grade white sugar that, that Saint-Domingue had been uh, famous for. Because behind all of this um, um, great propaganda and all the great progress, uh, that Christophe is making and the kingdom is is is, is making, there's a great tension uh, about the meaning of freedom. And um, a lot of people, they're being told they have to work on plantations. They're given a share of the profits. Um, and in fact, the abolitionists um, back in, in, in Britain look at the Code Honorary as this incredibly progressive work of law that gives uh, farmers far more opportunities than they have as if they were an English labourer. Um, but the, the project of the Kingdom of Haiti, and I think really the project of the early years of Haitian uh, independence, there is a tension as the country tries to work out what freedom means in a world of plantation slavery and a world of, of imperial, uh, of, of European colonialism. Um, now, Christophe, who... Um, had been a, a city dweller. He'd never uh, worked on plantations, uh, but had been uh, a leader of the, the military uh, from his perspective. In, and this is a perspective that was shared by Dessaline and, and Toussaint Louverture, was that freedom really meant nothing unless it can be defended um, against its enemies. Um, and so to buy freedom, uh, to defend freedom, you need to be able to basically buy gunpowder. And to buy gunpowder, you need export crops to grow this so if you're a Haitian in, if you're a person in newly independent Haiti your role is to defend freedom and you can either do that by being a soldier or by being a cultivator and as I said you're, you are given a share of the profits but you're not given a choice about whether you, you're on that plantation now if you're one of the foot soldiers of the Haitian revolution uh, who was born in Congo or was born in Benin or Dahomey or, or anywhere like this, your idea of freedom is probably going to be rather different. Your freedom is the freedom to be left alone, is the freedom to make your own life afresh in the circumstances that you find yourselves, um, to have your little plot of land and to grow your, your, your crops and really to have nothing probably to do with, with this entire project of state building. And there's a great tension uh, that that works itself throughout the, 
the, the, the kingdom and works itself throughout the entire period of early Haitian independence. And, and here is just a, a, photo, a photo, a portrait of, of Christophe um, looking worn down by the cares of this rule. This was almost certainly, we don't know the exact date, on, um, painted by a German painter almost certainly in 1819. Um, with the, the 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 worries of of maintaining this balance, and in the last year, um, in eighteen nineteen, uh, Christophe actually announces a program of land reform to break up these la large plantations and give land directly um, initially to to the soldiers because he's having trouble getting uh, laborers, and he's trying to sort of develop um, a, a a new system because. Uh, he feels that uh, that that Haiti can can start to stand down its its army a little bit, um, but this project uh, is never completed. Um, there is a tension um, again within sort of the nobility about sort of directions of travel in August. I mean, sorry, excuse me, in April, um, uh, eighteen twenty. Uh, he has a very public stroke. Uh, while attending mass, um, he is temporarily paralyzed, uh, continues to rule um, for the next few months. Um, but essentially, there's a, a coup d'etat against him, um, which Karen signs, <laughs> excuse me, with uh, a, the mutiny of an army regiment on the border with um, the Republic of Haiti. Christophe had already, always decried um the fact that napoleon allowed himself to be taken into captivity um so as the uh the coup spreads and his own regiments in, in cap um raise their arms against him um he retreats to his uh rooms in his palace in sans souci um as illustrated by this 1960s marvel comic uh, um, and uh he shoots himself um in the heart as legend will tell you um uh, with a gold bullet um and that's the end of the the kingdom it, it, it sort of comes to a slightly abrupt end within uh about three weeks um two or three weeks of his death uh Petion's success in Port au prince uh, president jean-pierre boyo uh, manages uh to march an army up from port au prince the 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 uh the people who held the, the, the coup, his generals try to sort of resist this. They they say they don't want to be part of the republic, but this doesn't doesn't last very long. Um, and uh, Sans Souci is basically is is looted. Uh, Boya essentially ends up having to close the port in Cap Francais because so much loot is, is leaving um, on ships belonging to uh, American and, and British merchants is why there's, there are still sort of quite a few items like that dinner plate, um, that are in this country. Um, we don't know what happened to most of it. We don't know what happened to his crown or the crown jewels. Uh, his wife, the queen, Mary Louise, um, the following year is, um, sent into exile. Um, she ends up in, uh, Suffolk. Uh, she spends a time living with, um, Thomas Clarkson, um, rents a house um, in Hastings and then in London. Um, last year, um, a blue plaque uh, was erected um, on Weymouth Street in Marylebone in London to, to commemorate the time uh, that she spent living there. Uh, and then eventually uh, she decides, um, as probably any sensible person who was growing up in the Caribbean, uh, that the British weather is uh, pretty naff um, and uh, emigrates to Italy where um, she lives until um, 1851, even outliving uh, Jean-Pierre Boy, who himself comes to a, a bit of a sticky end, which I think probably is a story um, for another time. I slightly overrun. I apologize for that. I'm going to stop sharing uh, my screen. Um, but if people have uh, questions, uh, then I'm really happy um, to continue the discussion. So thank you very much um, for your uh, for your attention. Thank you. Excellent. Um... That was really interesting. I think um, I think there are lots of questions that uh, we can think about. I, I should remind people that uh, they can ask questions in the chat or they can raise their hands. And if I see them, of course, I will recognize them. I will usurp my advantage by the chair's advantage by at least uh, asking a question initially. I think one of the interesting things about Henri Christophe is, of course, and something you talked about, is the British connection, the abolitionist con connection. And I think it might be interesting for uh, 
people uh, uh, in the seminar to hear a little bit more about that rather interesting uh, and important connection. Yeah, no, that's that's a that's a great point, and and I have to say that one of when I was in the very very earliest stages um, of working out that this there might be a, a kind of a project for me to research here. Uh, a, a key book was uh, the edited letters uh, between um, Christoph and Thomas Clarkson, uh, which was published at Griggs and Praetor, um, I forget the date, but, but a while ago. And it has a really, really fascinating correspondence, also with some letters uh, from Wilberforce um, and a few other abolitionists. And then we find more as we, as we work our way um, throughout the archives. Um, it was a really, really important uh, relationship uh, for Christoph because he repeatedly, you know, failed to to win diplomatic uh, recognition from Britain. And I, I have to say, I think that was really never on the cards. It, it very much suited Britain uh, to have um, a divided Haiti um, in the Caribbean. Obviously, this is you know, it's it's just a few miles away from Jamaica. We don't really want uh, the European powers recognizing an independent. Uh, black nation that's that's won its freedom by force of arms from slavery. It's it's not really a very great example for for the British regime in in Jamaica or or, or the Cubans uh, or or any of those others. Um, but in um, sort of this starts in about eighteen sort of fifteen eighteen sixteen. Um, he opens a correspondence with with Wilberforce. Uh, then Clarkson uh, gets involved. I think he has quite a different relationship with the two of them. Um, Wilberforce. Uh, likes to to lecture Christoph. Uh, he likes to uh, give a uh, spoonful of medicine uh, in every uh, 6,000 word missive that he sends um, Christoph. Um, and Christoph is, is I think, recognizes uh, the political influence and the power that the Wilberforce has, uh, but is also very adept at telling Wilberforce what he wants to hear. So Christoph says, I want to convert um, Haiti to Protestantism. Um, and in fact, there's a there's a, a great correspondence with the British uh, Foreign Bible Society, where it's agreed that they will provide a series of Bibles, which are uh, with uh, simultaneously in English and French. Um, and then the Bibles are printed um, and they get to Haiti. And then um, Julien Prevost, who's the Secretary of State, writes back to to um, to the to the missionaries um and says oh, i'm sorry these were all printed really badly I'm, I, we're not going to be able to take these uh, i'm very very sorry and some missionaries do actually come and christoph says they're going to be able to preach freely and they're back practically placed under house arrest um with clarkson it's a very very different relationship clarkson i think is much more of what we would today call an ally um christoph very much values clarkson's input and is a lot more open and frank uh with clarkson and he in fact um appoints clarkson as a sort of unofficial ambassador to france to sound out how relations with france and recognition from france can be obtained of course the front the french will never accept an ambassador because accepting an ambassador is acceptance of haitian independence which which is <laughs> unheard of um but he has a very, very good relationship with with Clarkson, and and I think we see that again um, after Christoph's death, where Mary Louise and Amethyst and Athenaire are welcomed in uh, by uh, Thomas and, and Dorothy Clarkson into their house in Suffolk, welcomed into into society. And when there are some incidents in that society where the Clarksons feel that the Christoph women are being treated fairly, being treated in a racist manner. They actually cut their friends, and this actually there's a, a quite a notorious example where um, Wordsworth comes to dinner um, and writes a uh, satirical um, sonnet about Queen Mary Louise, uh, which is a bit racist, um, and the Clarksons cut them completely. Um, and Dorothy Wordsworth actually writes to to, to Dorothy Clarkson and, and says, you know, what what did we do? Um, so Clarkson is is much more of, a, of, of an ally, and I think it's it's a really interesting thing. So Joseph Banks writes you know that he wishes he was a young man because he would love to go to haiti and see this this country being this new country being born and i think the fact that haiti is a kingdom is very nice for the british abolitionists they're not like these nasty french republicans who cut the heads off their kings and things like that and it's something that, that, that i think wilberforce in particular is easy for him um to get a handle on and i think also be flattered by to have a correspondence with with, with a king 
um, I think is something the abolitionists uh, do. So I think they, 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 that's a, it's a really, really fascinating relationship. And, you know, a lot of, of, of English teachers, missionaries do end up in, in Haiti. This is something I, I do certainly in, enjoy getting into in the book. But um, it's right. something that I think is, is being kind of forgotten a little bit with, um, with, with a lot of this history. Excellent. So uh, a couple of there are people who wish to comment, but there's some things in the chat. And Christian says, by the way, there's a plaque so people will know to Marie Louise in Hastings, which is kind of interesting. Um, and the first question in the chat is this one. Uh, how did Christophe square a commitment to freedom, liberation, etc., with the institution with the institution of monarchy, with its basis and notions of innate superiority, uh, familial succession, etc.? That's a that's a that's a really good question. And and when you read um, the uh, the Code Honorary, um, and in fact the the the, the Royal Constitution um, from eighteen eleven. Uh, these are quite explicit in this idea of we create a monarchy because then we have a pattern for society. Uh, the first line of the constitution, all of the constitutions of early independent Haiti, read slavery is forever abolished in, in Haiti. So that is, 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 is a given and, and those constitutions are inherently become more progressive than what was created in in 1789 or, or with with american independence and thomas jefferson and all of this um but christoph um in throughout the code honorary throughout the royal constitution he sees himself very much as the father of the nation with queen mary louise as the mother um and then everyone has their role to play within this family uh to build a free and prosperous um and enlightened and Haiti. So even um, if you are uh, effectively told that your position in life is to be a cultivator and work on a coffee plantation, you have rights um, to, uh, to, to to how you are treated. Uh, you are you are given a share of the profits, and the uh, the landholder or the landlord of the um, plantation has reciprocal rights in going down. Uh, to to the to the workers, but also going up to within you know the higher levels of, of, of Haitian society. Um, so it's sort of I wouldn't say it's that phrase the innate superiority. I mean, any time you you have a, a monarchy, of course you're you're dealing with that. And and Christoph, I think, is the ultimate for this period, the ultimate self-made man. He is he is born enslaved. He ends up the king of a free black nation in a sea of imperial slavery i think that is actually a revolutionary position even though he's given himself the title of king um mm. but that sort of freedom is he's looking at freedom for the nation and everyone having their their role to play within that i suspect that's very interesting and quite contentious actually but very interesting um carrie do you want to uh, unmute yourself Hi. Hi, Paul. Nice to ah, see you. Thank <laughs> Got you. More coffee. Uh, uh, thank you so much for this book. It's such an important contribution to the history of Haiti. Um, and I just wanted to ask a quick question uh, to kind of pull out a bit more about what Christoph meant to the Black Atlantic. I'm thinking about Jose um, uh, Antonio Ponte and when his rebellion gets uh, uncovered, there are images that involve Christoph. Um, the king of Haiti will free us, crops up kind of in various sort of revolts or conspiracies. And the second part of the question, I suppose, is where does he sit now in Haiti? So like, so I guess on one hand, you know, during the time of slavery, what did he mean? And then now, what does he mean to Haitian? So it's a two-part question. Thank you, Carrie. It's, it's so nice to see you on, on the screen after all, these, <laughs> after all these years. I say the same, um, by the way. Yeah, no, fantastic. So, um, uh so his position at at the time so it, this was a was a section that that actually kind of got got cut in the, in the writing and the rewriting and ended up um as a footnote in which i essentially tell everyone to go and read ada ferrer's amazing book Friedman's mirror about cuba and, and haiti in the early 19th century um because uh so carrie's just alluded to the 1812 um the aponte um 
I, rebellion is too strong a word, but the, the, the conspiracy uh, where um, this would-be revolutionary was um, arrested in Havana with um, this fabled lost book of paintings um, in which there are um, images, um, you can call them, I guess, black power images, including an image um, of Christoph um, as, as, as a king. Um, and there is a great, uh, you know, there is this great fear of contagion uh, across across the Caribbean. Um, and I think one of the the interesting things that um, that I uh, discovered, um, you know, from 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 Ada's book and and from some of the other archive work is that this is the time about 1812 when there's the the sort of um, the Spain. This is the time of the. Oh. Uh -uh. Paul, we can't hear you. Hmm. Maybe it will come back. Hmm. I think he's probably restarting it. There you go. You're off mute. You're not muted. You're muted. Paul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me now? I, you I apologize. It's okay. But your thing says. Okay. Sorry, but if, if someone give me a thumbs up, if you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah I'm. This is yeah. Um, I've lost my thread. Uh, the second part um, of the I'll move on to carries the second part of the, the question is how Christoph is 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 now. Um, I think uh, as as you, Toussaint was was not um, long lived. Of course, he never saw independent Haiti. Um, Dessalines was was assassinated within two years of of Haitian independence. But Christophe has left this incredible built legacy. And of course, this was what attracted me to the story from visiting the Citadel and Sanssouci during my own time. So you'll see um, statues of Christophe in, in Cap Francais, I mean, sorry, in, in Cap Haitian nowadays, where he's referred to as the civil, he's referred to as the builder. Um, and but North Haiti, um, there is a great pride in his achievements because you can see what what he built. And given how a lot of history, um, you know, uh, up to the American occupation and things, the the, the Citadel and Sanssouci are really you know tangible um, symbols of 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 Haitian rebel, of Haitian independence and and that freedom struggle. So um, while uh, the mainstream of Haitian history uh, uh, was written by the first Haitian historians of the 19th century were often, I think, quite dismissed of Christophe because he was a king and those early uh, Haitian historians like uh, Madiou and Ardouan uh, were very ardent Republicans who were very quick uh, to paint Christophe as, as a despot. Uh, for him, it, you know, he, he offered this alternate uh path for haiti and and he left by, behind this quite sort of tangible built legacy in the way that other um haitian leaders you know have certainly not managed okay thank you so louise in the okay, chat uh, okay uh louise in the chat uh says thank you fascinating lecture and other people have uh um said the same and she says you mentioned the code henri and wants to know what was his position on vaudon uh, knowing how important this was to the revolution. Yeah, so um, the official uh, um, king, in fact, after an has, has been hmm. uh, was the Roman Catholic uh -oh. and uh, voodoo was outlawed. Um, so we have a lot of letters, Christoph, particularly um, from uh, 1805, 1806, where he is leading um, uh, anti-voodoo campaigns in, in the north and, and clamping down um, on, uh, on dances. 
because there's a clear recognition in the black military uh, leadership um, about the, the revolutionary power of voodoo. And in fact, there's, there's one really great letter from uh, uh, Christoph where he complains that his comer is essentially his, his godmother um, had been sold fake uh, magic uh, potions and amulets uh, by someone who we would today call a, a hungan, uh, a, a voodoo priest. Um, so the answer is um, that voodoo was, was outlawed. Um, you know, Dessaline has become uh, has ascended okay. to the, now uh, a voodoo spirit in Loire. In uh, but we've never seen that. We can you hear me, Paul? Yeah, I can hear you. Yep. Uh, Eve suggests perhaps you want to turn your camera off for a minute so we can hear. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we can. Thank you, Eve. Hopefully that helps. Okay. And then maybe you can come back. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, since we're talking about Eve, let's ask Eve to ask her question. Uh, thank you very much, um, Paul. Um, yeah, brilliant book, brilliant presentation um, on Forever and All. Um, my first question, which is a bit tongue-in-cheek, is when when's the film coming out? Um, <laughs> <laughs> on a more serious note, um, I, I just, I think because, you know, you approach this from, well, exhaustive, um, exhaustive fieldwork, archival research, um, and... Uh, footwork as well basically you know you go everywhere and everywhere to kind of to find find what you're looking for um so maybe from a non-academic perspective then what what can we do to get this story out there more um obviously your book is a huge contribution um as Carrie said um and we're all very grateful to to have you here today but um just thinking kind of beyond the yeah beyond kind of well, where your research is 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 the boundaries kind of it's pushing and where and where your book's kind of the corners it's reaching. Um, just kind of asking a more general question about how do we get the Haitian story and this um, fundamental and such an important um, part of world history um, to audiences that will that it will resonate with, particularly looking at what's going on in the world at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I hope we haven't lost him. <laughs> Are you there, Paul? Oh, dear. I don't think he heard you, Eve. Oh, that's a shame. Mm. I mean, maybe while he's reconnecting, maybe somebody else wants to <laughs> wants to chat, chip in with some ideas. But well, I don't know if he, I don't, yes, I, oh, I see. Well, he could turn it on and off again, I suspect. That's the answer. Try that. It's a shame because we have I'm, some other questions. I'm back. And... I don't know. If... Ah. You can. You can. Yeah. Okay. If you can, yeah. My yeah. Sorry, I was yeah. It, it, this is a problem with with. My, I'm glad at least I managed to give the, the presentation. Ah. So. You think yeah, you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Um, well, I will just say thank you, Eve, um, for that that question. Uh, when is the film coming out? Um, if you know anyone uh, that can help me sell the film rights, I would, would love to 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 know that. Um, I didn't get all of that because my my connection did uh, cut out. Uh, but I, I would just say, um, as someone who is uh, has not come from a, an academic background, who's come from uh, a travel writing background, it was really uh, important for me uh, to write this as a trade book um, and not to, you know, I, I think I could have, we could have had this as, a, as an academic book quite easily. Uh, but but my aspiration certainly was was that this is a story that, that you know, I want people to, to know about. Um, and sort of following in the footsteps of, of Lauren Dubois' um, book, uh, Avenging, um, I've got a complete, Lauren, I've got a complete mental blank, um, Avengers of the New World, 
uh, obviously Hazari Singh's, uh, Sudha Hazari Singh's uh, Black Spartacus, which came out while I was in the middle of writing. And, and I would love for my book to be to be seen, you know, in, in that uh, lineage. Great. Uh, Nick has, a, a, has a, a sort of related question. You hear me all right, by the way? Paul? No? I think yeah. Yeah. you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Nick has a related question. He was interested, he'd be interested to hear about the interaction between your political and travel guide writing. Uh, do you know, he asks, if your guides attract tourists forward slash travelers moted by interests in decolonization and revolution? <laughs> what a what a brilliant question. Um, so my 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 guidebook to Haiti, I, I think, uh, is is possibly the only guidebook uh, you can get on the market uh, that quotes Michel Rothrouillot. Uh, <laughs> that's certainly my aspiration. Uh -huh. um and and baron de Vate as well um and it has uh there is a suspicious number of reviews of restaurants that are near to archives uh and that includes some of the other books that i've done um for jamaica and, and other things um but really um this the genesis of this book was from my first trip um in haiti uh in 2007 where i i and i have to confess that at that time i, I knew remarkably little about Haiti, it was it was um, run I buy a copy of Black Jacobins uh, to take and to read with me, um, and reading that um, in Haiti and to be in these places, uh, Bois Caiman, Vertier, uh, all of these other you know touchstones of the revolution was a real eye-opener for me and and i think more than many countries that i've, I've traveled in and, and now having had the the pleasure of, of living in haiti as well this is certainly um a country where where it's it's revolutionary history is really kind of written in the landscape and you don't have to go very far to find it and you don't have to talk to many people for the revolution uh to come up in in kind of regular um discourse uh and that for me, uh, was 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 irresistible, um, you know, and and being able to 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 go to the citadel or or to stay in Sans Souci and the sun is coming up, uh, really really formative moments for me um, as a travel writer, but also as a writer in in this project. Um, so if if people um, are interested in that uh i i would love it I, I wrote an article a few years ago for the age of revolutions website which is essentially a travel guide uh to the haitian revolution where i i go around and i do a little bit of travel writing for all of the key places um it, um you know which was a, a, re a really really fun project so uh one day i'm going to do my my walking tour i'm going to build my walking tour but but well uh yeah, that's going to have to wait until maybe haiti is in a, a slightly happier place um, you've talked about this a bit, but uh, Jerka asks, what effect did Chris, uh, Christophe's reign have on the neighboring Caribbean islands? Yeah, so that this is um, a little bit uh, that Carrie uh, was asking as well. Yeah. Um, so what I, we've, we've alluded to, uh, the, the, uh, the 1812, the, the Aponte um, conspiracy, uh it's, it's a difficult one because there was a great uh project to kind of to isolate uh haiti politically but throughout the the early years and i'm going to talk now about haiti not just christophe but also also petion's regime it was clearly seen as 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 a beacon as this great beacon of freedom this um you know this uh this this this, this place you know of, of freedom so so we see quite often particularly in the first sort of 10 uh, 15 years of Haitian independence, um, uh, enslaved people, particularly in uh, Jamaica and enslaved sailors, set effectively self-liberating themselves and making their way to Haiti, which is free. Um, and there's some interest between uh, particularly the, the Petion regime and uh, the British authorities in Jamaica, where the British are saying, well, we'd like our slaves back, please. Um, and Petion <laughs> says, well, there aren't any slaves because slavery doesn't exist in Haiti. These, these are these are free men. Um, 
There is one strand which I didn't have a chance to uh, really get into, um, and I, I have to, to thank Carrie actually for feeding me this nugget and then apologising for not being able to follow up about it. There was some early correspondence between Mexican revolutionaries uh, seeking the support of the Christophe regime. Uh, there may be some archive work to be done there in Mexico. And I think that is an interesting strand to follow up on, even though that uh, aid is never materialised. But because I think um, in this early Haitian period, it's it's kind of known uh, that the Republic of Haiti, of course, gave um, a lot of material um, and political help to Simon Bolivar um, and his project for the liberation of South America. But some of these other strands, you know, are really kind of waiting to be um, to be discovered. Very interesting. Of course, there was this migration at the time of the revolution of some Haitians to Jamaica, in fact, the other way around. But that's a separate separate point, I think. Uh, maybe the we worked you pretty hard. Maybe the the final question is from Isabella: Is this to what extent do you think Haiti is still affected by French colonialism and the impacts of the Civil War? And how can this, if at all, be brought into current discussions of reparations, especially considering the economic climate in Haiti? Well, this is a thank you, Isabella. This is a nice, easy, quick <laughs> question. Um, <laughs> yes. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll do this in 10, ten seconds. Um, I think uh, the circumstances of Haiti's birth, um, the double indemnity uh, that was brought to bear on Haiti in 1825 um, when Boye, uh, for reasons that I still think are not clearly understood, um, uh, capitulated to the French gunboats and signed Haiti into penury with this um, uh, debt uh, that it took. Uh, I mean, not just decades, the debts that were associated with that debt uh, were not paid off until 1947, when ironically, the French, uh, the Haitian government issued freedom bonds um, with an image of the citadel on it. And, and I, I think if Christophe had been in power, I, I think things may have gone a, a, a slightly different way. Um, but certainly the amount of money that was taken from Haiti uh, to repay uh, the French bankers, which of course was then um, compounded with um, the uh, entire contents of the Haitian National Bank being stolen by US Marines, uh, in 1915, at the beginning of the occupation um, and the privatization of uh, Haitian national industries at that time. Um, these are long and dark shadows um, that, of course, um, do continue uh, to play a role in, in modern Haiti today. Um, you know, the fact that Jean Berton Aristide, uh, when he came uh, to power, the 200th anniversary um, of Haitian independence in 2004, when he called for uh, the reparations uh, from France, um, is still an incredibly resonant issue. Um, and, you know, I think um, morally, um, you know, Haiti gave an incredible gift to the modern world in, in becoming the first modern nation uh, to completely and permanently abolish slavery and and showing um, what re a revolution can achieve if you're not, you know, compromised um, by the bourgeois interests of planters in New England or or um, the merchant classes of Paris and, and Bordeaux. Um, so I, I think, you know, this is very much a, a live and, and relevant um, discussion, particularly as it looks like um, it's possible that foreign troops may be on the ground again, um, led by Kenya, you know, sometime soon because of the current um, situation and the recent um, UN resolution. So, yeah, it's a very difficult question. Yeah. Well, here, I said there was a final question. Nathaniel has asked his usual very simple question, joke. Um, but here I will try to to, to tell you, and this, with this we'll have to end it. Uh Nathaniel says there's a way in which the history of the Kingdom of Haiti has become pigeonholed as merely French or Haitian history and silenced accordingly. What scope is there and what potential benefits might flow from advocating for this as British history? In this regard, I'm encouraging you to think, he says, 
not merely of Henri Christophe's birthplace or his family's visit to, uh, to Britain, uh, not, not mere presence, but of his and Baron de Vossi's significant intellectual influence on British abolitionism and British education, what we might call their perspectives. How do we get Britain to own the perspectives of Christophe and Vasti as constitutive, constitutive of British public discourse and indeed of Britain? Well, that's a very simple question for you. Wow, Nathaniel, that's a fantastic question. So my, my very short and, and slightly tongue-in-cheek answer to this, I think Christophe recognized by people starting to spell his name correctly. Um, <laughs> since this book is... It, Henri is spelled with a Y, and I've done, been thankfully reviewed a number, and even in seminars uh, where people seem, for some reasons that I still don't understand, uh, to just inspire uh, I. Um, I almost put a forward in the book uh, to say, please spell it with a Y. This is how he always spelled his name. Um, that's my reply. Um, I think hopefully my book can can contribute to this um, discussion. Um, and the, the, we've mentioned the blue plaques that are in um, London, and there's now the one in Hastings. And I really want to those two. And when she first approached English heritage uh, to get a plaque. With them she was knocked back because uh she was told that as far as english heritage were concerned uh the queen of haiti was not a significant figure uh with any relevance to english history and the plaques were done uh the london one is with the Nubian jack trust um and the plaque in hastings is done with black butterfly trust who are a, a black education chair in, in the south of england uh and i think that response from english heritage is quite instructive uh, I think one of the reasons is that that the story of Christopher generally is very, very little known. He was quite short lived, relatively speaking. I think, again, a pop culture and Eve asked when is the film going to be out? What a missed opportunity for Netflix and Bridgerton. Uh, they went and invented this fictitious uh, black, uh, you know, nobility in, in Regency England when right there on the plate was a real existing black monarchy that interacted with Britain. I mean, how great would that have been to have seen that on the screen? And I think, you know, having these people in, in popular culture, I think is... is mm -hmm. great. For someone to do a Penguin Classics uh, edition of, of his writing. Uh, you know, and I just hope that, you know, as, as this book comes out, and I, I think... Just sort of to backtrack a little bit, and I mentioned on um, the Wilson History Prize, which is such a, an amazing thing for a book of Haitian history uh, to, to do. Um, and I think we might now be ready for the stories of what happened after the Haitian Revolution uh, to be told, because I think in general, there's not enough understanding, I think particularly in this country, of uh, what the Haitian revolution uh is um but as these these stories become you know a little bit better told i mean america certainly is is, is far ahead of us of course they have a large haitian american community but we don't have them there's a very minuscule haitian diaspora in, in in this country um but you know i it was a really kind of at the forefront of my mind uh writing that we need to tell the story haitian history and the haitian revolution didn't stop on January the 1st, 1804, the, the, the story gets is just as interesting and just as compelling. And the fact is there is this story um, of, uh, uh, of this relationship with, with Britain. And I know there are certainly some plans which, you know, I can't talk about, but I know there are some exhibitions that museums are looking at to sort of in, incorporate this into some future exhibitions that might be going. And get this story out there and, and known a little bit better. Great. I think before your uh, system dies completely, I, I'd like to thank you very much. I'd like to mention to people that Luke has pointed out something in the chat about uh, Caribbean labor solidarity. We'll be discussing Haiti. So you can see that in the chat. Um, it really remains me to thank uh, to th 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 this um, incredibly interesting and people have commented 
uh, in the chat uh, about how interesting this has been, how what an interesting story it is, and how well, indeed, Paul, that you have presented it. Um, before we give a, a round of applause, I'd like to mention that the next, our next Caribbean seminar will be given on the 15th of November, about a month from now, on a Wednesday, by Cheryl Lynn Haggerty, called Ordinary People, Extraordinary Times, Living the British Empire in Jamaica, 1756. But uh, Paul, thanks again. Uh, really interesting. Uh, congratulations again on the book. And um, we look forward to the film. I think that's the best way to look at this. But yes, thanks. Thanks indeed very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Gary. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And my apologies uh, for my terrible internet. I'm, it held out at least um, until the Absolutely. end. Absolutely. Uh, at least, yeah, we, got, we certainly got the gist. Thank you, everyone. It's been a real pleasure talking to you all tonight. Yeah, well, we share that.